Hello and welcome to this Guardian Live event. I'm Zoe Williams. Um, I'm thrilled this evening to be joined by Keenan Mallet to talk about his new book, Not So Black and White. I'm sure you know his weekly columns in The Observer. He's also an author, a lecturer and broadcaster. He's appeared on Analysis and The Moral Maze on BBC Radio 4, but don't hold that against him, and Nightwaves on BBC Radio 3, which is brilliant. Um, he also, he's also written and presented a number of radio and TV documentaries, as well as a number of books on race, history, science, and human nature. I mean, I have to say this book, I'm sure there are many of you who haven't read it yet because you're not that swatty, but those of you who haven't, please go and get it at the very latest tomorrow morning because it's absolutely engrossing. It's a really scholarly, detailed, fascinating, page-turning, brilliant book, but that's just my opinion. Before we start, Here's how this evening will go. We'll be talking for about 40 minutes. We very much want to hear from you too. You can start sending your questions via the Q&A button now, and we'll come to those later in the evening. And if you like, please include your name, and I definitely will say that, and where you're joining from. So, hi, Keenan. Again, hi. congratulations. Thank Tell me, what when you... Um, what, what made you write this book? And, and did you feel like you were, did, did, how did you feel that you spoke to the current moment as it were? And how would you characterize the current moment? Well, clearly we, we are in a moment where, where politics is polarized, where um, we talk a lot about um, the culture wars, the politics of identity. But one of the things we have a tendency to do is to look at issues and problems out of context, um, just as things in themselves. And um, so a lot of the discussions about identity politics and the culture wars is as if um, they've suddenly appeared and that's all we talk about. And much of my work is about putting contemporary issues in historical context. And I suppose what's at the heart of not so black and white um, or what begins it is, what I've felt is a paradox of contemporary societies, because we live in an age in which in most societies, there's a, a moral abhorrent of racism, albeit that in most bigotry and discrimination disfigures the lives of, of, of many. But we also live in an age in which our thinking is saturated with identitarianism, with putting people into racial or ethnic boxes and defining people by the boxes into which they've been put. And it's as if the more we despise racial thinking, the more we seem to cling to it. And in a, in a sense, the book is, a, is, is, a, is an attempt to understand that, that paradox. And it seems to me to understand it, we have to understand the backstory, the story, not just of where we are, but of how we got to where we are. So it's a the book is both a story of the idea of race and of the struggles to confront racism and to transcend racial categorization. And also how those two histories intersect, because it's the history of that intersection of how concepts of race and of anti-racist struggles have related to each other. Um, I think you have to understand that relationship in order to understand uh, the nature of contemporary politics and where we are now. Yeah. Um, so you start with this with this real paradox, which is that race didn't create racism. Racial difference didn't create racism. Racism actually created race, created our conception of it. Can you explain that? Because it's it is such a fascinating story as well as as well as a notion. Yeah, I mean, most people, as you say, um, imagine that racism emerges when members of one race begin discriminating against members of another. That yeah. racism is what de derives when, from when races collide. So racists come first, yeah. racism comes after. And I, I want to argue it's the other way around. That intellectuals and elites began dividing the world into distinct racist to explain and justify the differential treatment of certain peoples. Um, and this is to look at race as a modern concept. It's not to say that prejudices or the categorization of distinct human groups were not deeply rooted in the pre-modern world. Um, on the contrary, that 
notions of difference and inequality and ideas about inferiority and the subhumanity of certain groups were integral to the, the, the pre-modern consciousness. But that's paradoxically why such prejudices are a long way from ideas, racial ideas in the modern sense, because only in a world in which principles of equality and a common humanity have been accepted can ideas of inequality and racial difference have meaning. Um, and that's why the notion of race in the modern world is different, and particularly in the post-Enlightenment world, is necessarily different to notions of group differences in the in, in, in the pre-modern world. But when you have what, what you have in, in, in the post-enlightened world are societies which are rooted in the idea of equality, yeah. um, of the rights of man as the French revolutions would have it, or um, the declaration of, 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 of American independence of, um, of, of human equality. But also the reality of societies in which there are deep inequalities, there is enslavement, slavery still exists, yeah. um, a, a world of colonialism and so on. And that makes it necessary to justify those inequalities in, 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 in a world that, is, um, uh, that presents itself uh, as, a, as, as one rooted in equality. And mm -hmm. race acts as a kind of um, means of, 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 of bridging that chasm between, between the, the, the abstract belief in equality and the reality of, 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 of a really deeply unequal um, uh, world riven by in, not just inequalities, but colonialism and slavery. So, uh, so yeah, so it's so, 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 no, so, so, the, the, the ancestors of today's African Americans weren't enslaved because they were black. Yeah. They were deemed to be black and a distinct race to justify their enslavement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was it was these it was those twin events. It was in in order to in order to use racism and racial difference as a as a kind of caveat for humane treatment of others. First you needed the enlightenment and then you needed to start treating people but in a barbaric fashion on an industrial scale. Is that true? Yeah, that the, the, there is a, people have always been treated barbarically in, in a yeah. sense that's, that's not um, uh, unusual. What is unusual is that they weren't, they weren't treated barbarically in a world that proclaimed its, its belief in equality and human universality. That's the difference. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's, it's the collision of those two things that creates race in the modern sense. Um, and for example, we think about race today primarily in terms of skin color mm -hmm. or of continent of origins of black, white, Asian, and so on. But that was not how, say, 19th century thinkers imagined race. For them, it was a, it was a uh, description of social inequality, not of skin color. Um, certainly they saw blacks and whites and Asians as distinct races, but they also saw um, laborers and farmhands in yeah, the same yeah, way. Yeah. It, may, it may be difficult to comprehend now, but 19th century thinkers looked upon the working class as a distinct racial group, physically, anthropologically different, in the same way as many now view black and white people as distinct racial groups. Um, and that's part of the ways in which the, the the, the collision of a belief in equality and the reality of an unequal society expressed itself. Um, that not just um, uh, black people or Asians or, uh, uh, or, or Chinese were, were, were racially different, but the working class was also racially different. Yeah, that is, that is absolutely fascinating. And it's fascinating to see that, um, you know, that conception of the working class as a separate race. Yeah, there's we that have having it. Event, eventually getting squeezed out by racism or squeezed yeah, out by racism. Sorry, you go. Sorry, um, we, we, we have a historical amnesia really about yeah, yeah. how the working class used to be perceived um, 150 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and how many of those groups we now call white were perceived 150 years ago. Yeah. Um, not just uh, Jews or Slavs or Spaniards, 
but or the Irish or the working class. But Benjamin Franklin, for instance, thought Germans were too swarthy to be white, that the only group who were unquestionably white were Anglo-Saxons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that, you know, for much of the 19th century, um, groups we now think of as white weren't seen as white or at least were seen as not quite white. And it wasn't until the 20th century that, you know, the contemporary conception of, of race and of whiteness develops. And it develops for two reasons. One is um, the, 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 the drawing in of, work, of the working class into the, into the democratic process. It becomes much more difficult to dismiss working class people as racially inferior when yes. they've yeah. got the vote, essentially. But also the, the extension of, of imperialism at the end of the, of, of the 19th century, um, the scramble for Africa, the, the seizure of islands in, in, in the Pacific by America and so on. And that, um, that, that the new imperialism drew, drew what um, uh, Du Bois called the color line and made race much more a question of color, um, of skin color, than of social differences, as it had been in the previous um, century. I mean, just 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 to go back for, on two tiny on two things. So the, this is fascinating about the taxonomies of whiteness, the hierarchies of whiteness in America. So you have Anglo Saxons at the top and Teutons, and then Celts are effectively not white because they're yeah. so base. Yeah. Um, do you feel like that was? Do you think, feel like that was mirrored in Europe? Do you feel like? America exported that to Europe, or do you feel like Europe was undergoing something completely different? No, it was very much mirrored in Europe. So if you look yeah. at British writings about the Irish, yeah, you yeah. find exactly the same. Um, it was Kingsley, Charles Kingsley, I think, who, who talked about um, the, the, the going to Ireland and being um, appalled at seeing white chimpanzees on the streets. Um, and Carlisle, Carlisle was when, when Carl, Thomas Carlisle, you know, who was the, one of the great figures of 19th century uh, British literature, um, British letters. He wrote a very provocative, um, uh, provo uh, deliberately abusive piece about um, uh, in, about um, emancipation, slave emancipation in in the West Indies, and he said that emancipation would would turn the West Indies into a black Ireland. It's a, it's so you can see the way that these um, uh, ideas are not just American, they're, 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 they're deeply rooted in European um, uh, beliefs too. Um, yeah. And there was John Beddow, who's, a prof who's in fact the president of the Royal Anthropological Society at the end of the 19th century. He produced a map of, a racial map of Britain, of the British Isles, where, he saw um, the Celts, the Welsh, Scottish Highlanders, um, and the Irish as being closer to um, prehistoric man than to contemporary humans. Right. Um, and uh, there was he even had a had a um, a formula, a mathematical formula, to describe how much what he called negrescence, uh, blackness, was in the British population. In, in, and, and of course. Um, uh, nice white submers had the least amount of degradation, whereas the Celts had the greatest amount. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he had a yeah, mathematical yeah. formula to try and describe that. I loved your mathematical. I mean, not yours, obviously, <laughs> but but the formula was absurd. It was kind it of it was completely of, absurd. Yeah, but it was taken as it was taken to be to be to be um, scientific. So it's it's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's almost as though just in tandem with those um, enlightenment ideals of equality, the equality of man, the, the kind of nascent form, the, the nascent understanding of science shoots up these absolutely wild ascientific theories. Yeah, I mean, science was not, did not create race and racial differences, but it yeah. became a means of justifying racial differences by giving them some kind of racist idea some kind of scientific aura yes yeah 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 that's yeah. the science place i mean um, in principle um the theory of evolution darwin's theory of evolution should have demolished any notion of of of, of um, racial science yeah. because racial science is about the fixed groupings of people um 
uh, races are fixed groups, whereas uh, the theory of evolution is about um, flexibility and, 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 and mutation and change. Yeah. But in fact, what happened was that uh, racists, racial scientists, um, just took Darwin's ideas and remade them in a way that made uh, 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 ju provided justification for, for, for racist views. Yeah, I mean, just as racism created conceptions of race, I think you 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 argue as your argument goes on, it does sound as though anti-racist movements essentially created democracy. Essentially, you know, anti-racist yeah. movements in in a kind of, in 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 kind of answer to that drive yeah. were really key in creating democracy. Well, the way I would put it is that um, whereas many uh, European thinkers, Enlightenment thinkers, were happy to marry uh, a, an abstract belief in equality with support for racism, colonialism, uh, for um, slavery even in, in cases, yeah. um, it was through the struggles of those who were denied um, equality and, and universality that the ideas of equality and universality um, receive real meaning. I mean, we, we there's, there's been for, for, for a while now a, 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 a fierce debate about the Enlightenment. Yeah. Um, is it good, is it bad, uh, and so on. And the interesting thing is that both supporters and critics present it as a, a peculiarly European phenomenon. For one, it's a demonstration of the greatness of Europe, for the other, a reminder that it's, that it's um, ideals are tainted by racism and colonialism. And what both, it seems to me, miss yeah. out is the importance of the non-European world in shaping many of the ideals we associate with the Enlightenment, because it was through those, the struggles of those denied equality and liberty by the elites in Europe and America that ideas of universalism were invested with, with meaning. Um, a, a really good example is the Haitian Revolution which is plays a central yeah. role in, 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 in the book. Um, because no single event, I think, more profoundly reveals both the necessity of and the shortcomings of the Enlightenment than the Haitian Revolution. I mean, it's one of the three great revolutions of the 18th century. Mm. But when compared to the place that the American and French revolutions have in our culture, um, it is barely remembered. Um, and yet it was through the Haitian Revolution where the, the slaves of Saint-Domingue, which is a French colony, um, uh, dismantled their chains, declared an independent nation, defeated the armies of uh, France uh, and subsequently of Britain and of uh, Spain um, to, to, to create a free nation. That the emancipatory logic of the Declaration of Rights of Man was for the first time seen through to its conclusion to its revolution conclusions in a sense the French revolutionists overthrew the old regime in 1789 in the name of the rights of man but they refused to apply those rights to the colonies um, whereas the insurgents of Saint-Domingue forced French revolutionists in a sense to take seriously their own revolutionary ideals and it was through that revolution that slavery was for the first time abolished um, in the 1790s. It's, it, it is so fascinating because it, it, so much of Enlightenment thought is that kind of almost escape, escape room maneuver of trying to, you know, have revolutionary egalitarian ideas, but not apply them where it's economically stroke socially inconvenient to you. It's the, it's the, it's a contrast between, um, ideological beliefs, ideals that are hugely important and which have shaped the modern world and, and, and to which um, I would hold on to as uh, an anti-racist. Mm -hmm. And the practice of um, the emerging capitalist societies, um, which enforced uh, colonialism, which enforced slavery, which enforced inequalities. Um, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the gap between the ideals and the practice um, that's important. Yeah, I mean, there is a, 
there is a kind of strong top note as you get to the end of that you kind of reach the end of that French revolutionary period and then begin to see well obviously America by that point has become a slaving nation and a lot, a lot of racial distinction is brought into being a lot of racial debasement and debasing language is brought into being because some somebody has to because they're the horrible work of what would seem to them to be the modern era they have to find a way to make it only one type of person's job it's almost like industrialization plays a part in there as well well it's interesting if you if you look at the um a lot of sociological theory at the end of the 19th century um what it suggests is that class distinctions were originally race distinctions that um that different racial groups fought it out as to who would be who would do the easy jobs and who would do who would be the, the managers and, and 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 overlords and who would do the dirty jobs yeah. um i think it's lester ward who's the first uh, president of of the American Sociological Association had a had a, a deeply um, uh, worked out theory about how um, the the original fight over um, what jobs people should do, what work people should do, was a was a racial conflict, yeah. which became which then um, turned after the victory of of of, of, of the group that became um, the the the, the uh, overlords the. Uh, the ruling class turned into a, a class distinction um, and much of 19th century sociology is about how racial distinctions became transmuted into class distinctions because classes were seen as racially distinct yeah 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 and when you when you get to when you come to discussing the creation of white identity that's actually it's as much a kind of drawing together or in a way, a kind of putting aside the old taxonomies of whiteness in order to be supreme over blackness. It's like white identity has to cohere as a single thing in order for racism to be meted out to other nations. And I wonder whether that's kind of, whether kind of slavery or colonialism makes, you know, whether the American experience of having imported a huge number of humans, it, creates a different kind of white identity to the European experience of, of doing all their brutalizing elsewhere. Uh, I, would, I disagree with you in the, it, when, when you say that um, there has to be a kind of coalesced, certain, uh, d d defined notion of whiteness in order to, um, uh, to, to 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 have a, a racial view of the world. In fact, right. for much of much of the 19th century, um, what was white and who were whites were, were, was 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 um, fiercely debated. I yeah. was part of that debate about about what race was. So race, whiteness, and race are are, are contingent. They're they're not necessarily um, uh, uh, related. Um, and in the 19th century. Um, many of the, the groups that we now see as, 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 as whites, as we've talked about, um, were not seen as white. They were seen as racially distinct. So it's, it's a much more complex story than that, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And, the, and the, as white supremacy, the, you kind of you, you do tell this very complex story in which kind of American... Um, exceptionalism and white supremacy are two completely different things until suddenly they're not and european exceptionalism which kind of marries into in like you know we are exceptional because we created the enlightenment it again turns into a because it because the reality of the colonies would kind of pollute it otherwise it becomes a narrative of white supremacy so people who say now that the enlightenment is a racist creed that's what they're going to effectively isn't it yes and and they're, they're only they're only um partly right largely yeah. because uh, the, the 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 distinction i'm trying to draw is between um set of ideals that are important um and significant for those uh, fighting for social justice yeah. and the practice 
and the reality of societies which denied those ideals to the majority of the world. Yeah. Um, and we've got to keep both in mind. It, it, it isn't, it, part of the problem is that, is that because um, ideals of uh, equality and universality were, were denied for much of the world, people started questioning whether uh, European ideas had any worth. I, if ideas that um, uh, at best did not prevent the subjugation of the rest of the world, at worst um, was implicit um, in that uh, subjugation, what worth were, are those ideas? So, and so many started arguing that um, non-Europeans had to develop their own ideas their own beliefs, their own values rooted in their histories, their, their, their cultures and so on. Um, uh, and, the, and, and so the, 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 um, the arguments against uh, European rule, against imperial rule, against racism, became an argument against European ideas um, uh, per se. Uh, and it's out of that that what we now call identitarian politics emerges. I mean, there have always been identitarian strains within um, uh, anti-colonial, anti-racist movements, yeah. precisely because of that um, uh, uh, of that paradox of of of, um, of enlightenment ideals both giving rise to um, uh, idea, important ideas of equality and, and universality, and the social practice of societies that deny those ideals to most people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we get on to identitarianism, because it has so much to teach us about kind of modern racist and anti-racist movements, the starkest section of the book is where you trace the roots of the Holocaust back to kind of learnt behaviours through German colonisation, but also French and British, of course. Can you talk me through, talk us through that? Yeah, Nazism did not come out of nothing. Um, yeah. It was made possible by the ideas of race that had become deeply rooted in uh, Western societies and by the practices of colonialism. I mean, what was unique about Nazis was the particularity of anti-Semitism and the zeal with which they pursued their Aryan dreams and their willingness to import colonial practices into mm -hmm. the heart of Europe. Um, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the the Caribbean poet and statesman Aimé César, he observed that the truth the Euro Europeans had to face about Nazism was that before they were its victims, they were its accomplices, that they shut their eyes to it because it was only applied to non-European peoples. And, and the yeah. savagery of empire is something we often forget, um, that uh, the degree to which non-European peoples were treated in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a really barbaric sense. Um, and that it is out of that, I mean, um, the, um, Hannah Arendt makes a point in The Origins of Totalitarianism that, that the German elite learned um, uh, how to deal with, in inverted, bar, inverted commas, barbarian races, inferior races uh, through its colonies. Yeah. And, it, it, it then imported that back into back to Germany. So it's yeah. in, that that I'll, I'll, there's a danger, of course, that we lose the 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 the, um, the importance, the significance, the uniqueness of the Holocaust. But there's also the danger that we don't we see it somehow sui generis as somehow uh, out of context of the rest of um, uh, Western history. Um, yeah. And it's important to, to recognize both that, that there, there is something. Um, uh, unique about the Holocaust, but also that it arises and Nazism arises out of ideas and practices that were common prior to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and before we move on from that period, can you describe because you describe the transmogrification of um, you know direct hostility to Jews, which of course has been a feature for centuries into anti-Semitism in its modern, in it, in it, with its kind of modern face that became the Holocaust. Can you describe that change and that shift? Sure. I mean, modern anti-Semitism is distinct from pre-modern 
anti-Jewish hatred in the same way as modern racism is is distinct from from pre-modern prejudices. Um, and just as the notion of racial difference has a very different meaning in a world that has accepted the ideals of equality and universality, and then it does in a in, in a world where in, in a world where um, those ideals have no meaning at all. So the meaning of bigotry towards Jews has a very different meaning in a world in which Jews have um, achieved emancipation, however fragile or uneven that may have been. And I suppose the, the immense shadow of the Holocaust and also the founding of, of Israel has obscured the magnitude of Jewish emancipation in the 19th century, um, both for the lives of Jews and in transforming the meaning of anti-Jewish hatred. So prior to um, the 19th century, Jewish practices and um, uh, rituals and occupations made sense um, in a world in which differences were viewed as natural and inevitable. Mm. Whereas emancipation, the idea that, of, of equality for Jews, turned the whole issue on its head because the differences of Jews and, and the barriers that still existed to full emancipation and such social life were now seen as an anomaly, a challenge to the claims of, of equality. And that distinction came to be seen by the end of the 19th century in racial more than in religious terms. Um, and, and Jews were, were, were seen as not just religiously distinct, but as racially distinct. There, there's some kind of essence of Jewishness that, that, they, that they had, whether they were religious or not, that, that distinguished Jews from, from, from um, other peoples and other races. And the, and, and, and the paradox, again, is that whereas previously, distinct Jewish distinctiveness um, uh, was, was seen as, 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 as something backward or um, uh, uh, dis different from, from the rest of society. Mm -hmm. By the end of the 19th century, Jews were hated because for the, for the opposite reason, because they embodied modernity and cosmopolitanism. And, and there's a kind of complete shift in, in the way that the, what Jews are, in, uh, are representative of, um, uh, there's a complete shift in that um, over the space of a century. But, then, but it, do, it did still require that hatred to be able to protect, project itself onto any kind of Jewish person, right? You know, Indeed, you, yeah. Um, Indeed, and, that, yeah. and that does mirror what you were writing about at the very, uh, at the very start of kind of conceptions of racial difference, that racism it had to be able to be projected in a very wide way, otherwise it kind of collapsed. Yeah, ra racism becomes, it's like a lens through which you understand the world. Okay. Um, it's not simply a question of treating one group different uh, from another. It becomes a lens through which social differences, human differences make sense. And it's the only lens through which you understand those differences. Yeah. Yeah. Um, moving, moving. I, I don't want to skip the union movement, but I think we have to. Maybe somebody in the audience ask a question about Teamsters. Um, there's moving on to the kind of present day. Can we? Can you just describe exactly what identitarian means and what you think it's what? How you think it iterates in our discourse at the moment? Yeah, I think I think we need to distinguish between identity and identity politics. Yeah. Um, because the two are often confused. Um, identities are of great significance to us. They give each of us a sense of ourselves, of our grounding in the world, of our relationship to others. Politics, though, is a means or should be a means of taking us beyond the, the kind of narrow, constituted sense of identity given to each of us by um, the specific circumstances of our lives um, and the particularities of our, our personal experiences. So, you know. At, at, at a personal level, I was drawn into politics because of my experience of racism. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a very different Britain um, to Britain of today, where racism was visceral and vicious, and um, fire bombings and stabbings were 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 weekly events. Um, but if racism drew me into politics, it was politics that made me see that. There's more to social injustice than the injustice done to me. That, and that um, 
it allowed me to see that that the way um, that, that what was important in 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 making um, uh, in, in in creating solidarity wasn't the race or the ethnicity or the culture or the faith of anybody else. It was their beliefs, and that yeah. I would rather make solidarity, have solidarity, create common cause with somebody. In fact, I only make common cause with somebody who has the same beliefs as me, same values as me, um, uh, whatever their, their race or ethnicity or culture or faith, mm -hmm. than with somebody who has the same ethnicity or culture or faith as I do, but whose values are different. Yeah, yeah. And it seems to me that's the distinction between thinking about identity and identity politics. Um, yeah. There's always been identitarian strains within um, uh, anti-racist, um, anti-colonial movements. Um, you know, if you go back to the 19th century, there are back to Africa movements. There are there was Garveyism at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Pan-Africanism, Negritude, and so on. But for much of that time, it was that they that those those kinds of movements were relatively um, marginal. Mm. Um, I mean, there were time when they became um, major movements, but um, overall they were relatively marginal. And 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 the struggle against racism uh, for social justice uh, was rooted in in a in the belief in universal politics, the universal values. Mm. It's only in the post-war years that um, identitarian arguments have become much more dominant. Um, it isn't that they've suddenly arrived, it's, they've suddenly um, uh, become important, it, 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 that, that they've suddenly um, uh, been established. They've always been there, but they've become more and more important in the post-war years. And, seems to me there are a number of reasons um, for that. I mean, one is what, the, the, what we've been talking about, which is that gap between uh, ideals and reality, between the mm -hmm. abstract ideals of belief in equality and, re and the reality of a world built on race and colonialism, which led to many questioning the very worth of those abstract ideals um, and to questioning the idea that European ideas uh, could have any value for those fighting um, against racism and colonialism. Um, that non-Europeans had to develop their own ideals and their own beliefs and their own values rooted in their cultures and histories. Mm -hmm. um, there was also disenchantment, growing disenchantment with, in a broader sense, with um, the Enlightenment. One of the impacts of Nazism was to discredit ideas of biological race. But it also discredited ideas of Enlightenment universalism because many came to see um, Nazism as, as the product of Enlightenment rationality and um, Enlightenment universalism. And the third factor is the, the rise of culture as, a, um, as, as the medium through which we discuss human differences. Um, in the post war world, post Holocaust world, racial ideas. Um, were uh, they, they didn't disappear, but they were they became they, for, for many people they, they, it was morally abhorrent to hold racial ideas and to root policies, social policies, public policies um, in uh, racial terms. And so we started thinking about human differences in cultural terms, um, in uh, the language of multiculturalism, of ethnic pluralism, and so on. Yeah. But culture, in many ways, the, the way we think of culture is functionally equivalent to that of race. In other words, we, 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 don't, we don't see one group as being, well, some people do, but, but mostly we don't see one group as being culturally inferior, superior to another. Mm -hmm. But we see culture as somehow expressing the essence of a people rooted in history um, yeah. uh, that distinguishes one group from another. Um, and that that essence is carried by culture rather than by race. Um, and, and, and so culture becomes a way of, um, in, in a sense, you know, the ghost of racial 
ideas become smuggled into the way we think about culture. Yeah, that's so but, interesting. But I think the most important thing is actually social pessimism. That um, the, the most important shift in 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 um, making identitarian views um, dominant is, is um, a sense of of disenchantment or, or with the possibilities of social change. A radical universalist view requires a belief in social change and belief that it is possible to overcome the fissures of race and identity to build movements of solidarity to radically transform society. But that's a belief that has ebbed over the past half century with the disintegration of wider social movements and radical struggles, the weakening of labor movement organizations, the disintegration in many places of the left. And it's led people to, I think, cling more fiercely to their own identities and um, to, to, to think about values and beliefs um, in, in, in identitarian terms. So rather than um, we see ourselves in terms, you know, socialist or communist or conservative or liberal, um, we quite often define our values and, and beliefs in terms of our identities, they're white, black, um, European, uh, gay, um, Muslim, so on. And th those become means of defining um, not just uh, our who we are, but also what we should believe, um, what, what our values are. Um, and I think yeah, that's yeah. an important shift um, because we kind of cling to, our, to those identities because as hopes of social change have eroded, um, many people have been led to hunker down almost mm -hmm. in, their, in, in their separate boxes. And the more that one hunkers down, the more that those boxes become the only way through which to perceive the world. And the more that one's race or identity looms ever more uh, larger in one's consciousness. So I think there's a kind of series of changes that have taken place. Um, that have allowed identitarian perspectives to become dominant. But the most important, I think, is, is social pessimism. OK, um, we've got to go to the audience now because they're, they're, they're a very lively bunch. And they're, but there's a great question, which I think ties into that social pe pessimism, which I don't quite feel that you've, you've kind of, um, it, it, well, listen to Simon Bright's question. He asks, do you think identity politics is sustained and supported by 21st century capitalism because it helps by segmenting the market into identity based markets to create new more markets? But that is that sort of goes into what you're saying about pessimism, that we're that, that, that we, we're sort of sorting ourselves into ever, ever more fractured um, categories. And do you think that's do you think that benefits capitalism? Do you think that's a result of late stage capitalism? I, th I think that, that there, there is a, a lot of truth in that. And the way I would look at it is the way that we've, we've um, divided or, or, or separated um, ideas of economic inequalities and political inequalities. In, and that um, we live in societies where we talk a lot about political equality mm. in, this, in the sense that we talk a lot about um, race and um, uh, gender and... and, and um, gay rights and so on, um, hugely important. But in a sense, we also, we're also societies which accept at the same time um, economic inequality. We talk a lot about the pr presence of inequalities, but we, we kind of, we accept that that's almost inevitable. And it's a separation of the, of the economic and the political, I think has become um, hugely important. And, um, Diversity, which one of the problems has been that the way that the idea of equality has become translated into that of diversity, um, that, that a diverse world somehow is a more equal world, but it isn't. That equality and diversity are not synonymous. Equality, I mean, diversity is good in the sense that it, it, we like institutions in, um, that represent the, the world as it is, um, society as it is. Um, but but it's quite possible to have a diverse society. We do have a diverse society, which is deeply unequal. And 
um, part of the problem is that, it was that when we talk about inequality, um, the, 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 the underlying um, economic class-based equalities often get forgotten or certainly um, become marginalized compared to uh, political e inequalities. And it's that separation of the political and the economic, I think, uh, is, is hugely important. Yeah. Uh, before I go to the next question, can I just remind everybody that you can put a question in yourself just on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I think it's about two thirds to the right. So do go for it. In the meantime, Rosemary Stevenson actually speaks for a lot of people when she says, do you think this country is less racist than when she grew up in the 1940s and 50s? Um, has it still got a long way to go? Where, I mean, I suppose, where would you situate where would you situate us on the timeline from total prejudice to total diversity? Well, it's certainly a lot less um, racist than it used to be, so a lot less racist than when I was growing up. So it's a lot less racist in the, in the 70s and 80s, um, when racism was, was deeply embedded in, 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 the society, in, in a way that it's difficult to imagine. That. I mean, I'm, I, can, I can remember as a child, getting on a bus and, and, and um, the woman getting up and going to sit somewhere else um, uh, because of who I am. I mean, I, I can barely remember a, a day coming back from school when I hadn't been in a fight um, uh, because of my skin colour. Um, all that, you know, th th that kind of world has thankfully become um, uh, has receded. I mean, it's not that racism has disappeared. The racism uh, exists in, in 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 all manner of ways, but the kinds of visceral racism that the the, the, the um, infected Britain forty years ago is less so now. Um, but no, but but that, but it doesn't mean that the the racism has disappeared. Um, one good example um, is uh, ra is. Uh, Racism in the in the um, in, in the labour market. Yeah. Study after study, for instance, have shown that if you um, a, apply for a job with a white sounding name or with a minority sounding name, you are far likely more likely to get an interview and a job if if you're not perceived as being um, non-white. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, th th it's a well well established. Um, uh, set of studies so yes racism still exists um but but i think we also have to to recognize how much has changed and how much more liberal um britain has become over the past 40 50 years so i have a kind of aligned question from ali ratanzi who's a professor of sociology and he wants to know how you or she wants to know how you define class how many classes do you dis discern in contemporary capitalist societies um you know how would you define the working class and are these are these are these categories fixed um there i mean there are there are um different ways of, of, of talking about the working class I, I i still um stick to the old-fashioned way of thinking of those who own the means of production those who don't own the means of production those who have to work for a living as, as being the distinction um between between classes but um but of course, we have a much more cultural view of class these days. And yeah. um, yeah, 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 class yeah. has become an almost um, uh, cultural attribute that one has. But one of the interesting things, and one of the important things, I think, is that we tend to look on whites and non-whites in different ways when it comes to the question of class. So we look at minorities as belonging to almost classless communities. And we talk about you know, the black community or the Muslim community or, uh, and so on. Um, uh, and often uh, and often forget the divisions of those communities into class and class becomes something that gets applied to um, the white population um, and so the, you know the, the, the thing everybody talks about is uh, the white working class yeah. um, and the white working class which to me is, is an odious term um, yeah. but the white working class is seen more in terms of their whiteness and in terms of their class position, that what makes the white working class, um, so if we talk about education and the fact that um, white boys do pretty badly at school compared to um, uh, uh, many other groups, 
that um, the, in talking about those issues, um, what seems to matter more is not the fact that they're working class, which is where a lot of uh, the, the, the issues arise from, but the fact that they're white. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so, so class itself has become racialized in a way. Um, uh, it's become a kind of racial or ethnic identity. Um, and that is a major problem, it seems to me. Yeah. Um, Annick wants to know if you could comment on internalised racism and white supremacy, um, presumably pervading black people, he or she says, I, I, you know, giving the example of the recent discourse in the media about black, black Memphis police killing a black guy. Um, but you, I mean, you write so powerfully on this with Franz Fanon and, you know, seeing and, and that whole negritude um, arc and you know the struggle to see yourself to define yourself not as you're defined by the, your colonizers or owners do you think the hangover of internalizing oppression is much longer than maybe we think i would no no i i would quest i mean go take the the, the issue of of um that you raised about uh killing of a black man by five black officers in in America Tyree Nichols um what's interesting is if if you look at um policing in America um the people who get killed by uh the police who get uh, abused and beaten up by the police aren't simply black people um working class whites also do um and the best uh, measure of uh, whether or not you're likely to be killed by the, by the police, it's not actually race, it's income. Um, areas yeah. in which you are more likely, uh, it, 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 areas of um, uh, poorer areas um, are more likely to face um, police abuse than richer areas, I mean, that, 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 that's, that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. But um, it, it ha also happens that, that black people, um, African-Americans are disproportionately uh, working class and poor because of racism. But if we reduce the, the problem of um, policing, to simply that of race, then we actually miss out what the problem that is with American policing, which is its brutality and its militarization. Um, and the way that that applies as much to um, in white working class areas as it does to um, black areas. So um, do you feel- we, we, just, we need to be careful, I think, in the way we, we, we look at it and, the, and we look at the relationship between race and class. Because actually, I mean, that, that this is the hard edge of where identity politics is sort of undoing the left, because there are a lot of people on the left who would say, in denying the kind of racial foundations of violence against black people, especially in America, but not, not never here, um, where that is, a, that is a kind of open provocation, really. I mean, and it's, and it, you could divide a, you could divide a momentum meeting with that very quickly. Put it that way. Yeah, I'm. I'm not saying that racism that, that racism plays no part. I mean, racism clearly plays a part in, in policing. What I'm saying is that um, we should not think about abusive policing simply in terms of of, of race. And that if you look at um, the problems of policing in America, it is that of a militarized policing of areas um, seen as um, th that are uh, poor and dispossessed. And there happen to be both black and white. If you look at incarceration, this is uh, another issue in America. Um, there's been a lot of uh, talk about the roots of the mass incarceration over, uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in US prisons. Mm. Um, America locks up more of its uh, population than any other country in the world, a greater proportion of, of its population. Is, it's, it's quite extraordinary the, 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 the rise in the, in the proportion of people who've been, who are um, uh, incarcerated. Yeah. But again, um, black people have, uh, have felt the brunt of it. Mm -hmm. 
And this has given rise to the idea that what we have is a new Jim Crow. Um, Michelle Alexander wrote a book on, on that. Yeah. But again, if you look at the figures, what you find is that if you look at every income level, at every income level, the difference between the incarceration of whites and the incarceration of blacks is actually very small. What is, what is major are the differences between um, uh, uh, income levels. And because African-Americans are disproportionately poor and black, uh, mm -hmm. poor and, and, and working class, so they're, they're also disproportionately incarcerated. But again, it's important to recognize that, um, that, that this is not a problem simply of racism in terms of incarceration. It, it is a problem of the poor and um, working class um, getting incarcerated to a far greater degree than, than, than those who are richer. And if you are a wealthy uh, African-American, you're far less likely to be incarcerated than if you're uh, someone who's poor and white. Um, yeah. So again, we, we, we kind of, it's a complex, it's a complex um, story of the relationship between race and class, which we too often um, uh, kind of wash out the nuances and, and the complexities of. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, th uh, some uh, viewer, an audience member called, known only as MB is asking a lot of really good questions. So I'm going to give you all three and you can de decide which one you prefer. Um, on the one hand, if, if race is simply a myth, are we perpetuating that myth by carry, continuing to talk about it? And we should talk about colorism and reduce it to color since that's what the kind of original attempt to separate people was. He also, or she, asks whether or not capitalism is just indivisible from racism. It creates the conditions, exactly as you describe, in which a, a, the vast majority of people in the lowest decile are one race, and that's a function of inequality rather than prejudice, in a sense. Um, and he or she, okay, either choose between one of those and answer it. Yeah. Um... We can't, I mean, much as we'd like to live in a post-racial society and get rid of racial categories, mm -hmm. racial categories clearly shape our lives. The question isn't about how we get rid of, 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 of racial, of, 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 the question isn't about, shall we just get rid of idea of race? Race shapes all our lives. The question is how we go about getting rid of the idea of race um, and, and whether, um, racial categories are useful in understanding um, every social issue in which there are, there are disparities between blacks and whites. I mean, this, uh, it, it's one of those unfortunate things that because there are disparities between blacks and whites in all, mm -hmm. on, 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 a, on many number of measures, we, because we're obsessed by the question of race, we think that race then explains that disparity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, um, on a whole host of different, from education to imprisonment, class is often a better e explanation for, for those disparities because of the fact that, that minorities tend to be disproportionately working class and poor. And in ignoring the question of class, what we're really doing is ignoring the fact that a large proportion of minority communities um, who are working class um, and for whom the solution to their problem is class-based, not race-based. Um, on, on that note, sadly, we've run out of time. I hope we were able to get to some of your questions. I know we didn't get to them all and I'm really sorry. Um, if you haven't already, as I said at the start, please go out tomorrow and buy Not So Black and White. It's so thick with so much detail and, and beautiful logic. I, I really enjoyed it. And to read more from Keenan, including an extract from his book, search for Keenan Malik on theguardian.com. To find out more about future Guardian live events, visit theguardian.com forward slash Guardian live. You may be particularly interested in the Guardian's former China correspondent, Tanya Brannigan, who is speaking to Johnny Friedland about the legacy of Mao's cultural revolution. That's this Thursday. And then on March the 7th, Ibran X. Kendi will be talking about his best-selling book, How to Be Anti-Racist with Owen Jones.
Thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. We'd love to hear what you thought of the event, so please do the survey at the end. Um, and finally, most importantly, huge thanks, Keenan. I just thought, well, you know what I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here.